Magistrates Court, Christchurch, December 1969. Judge Hedefin is addressing the defendant before him in his summation before he passes sentence. Dealing with you as a person, you are 52 years of age, and apart from a parking offence, you have not appeared in this court before. It has been submitted you suffer from some sort of hypomania, but a psychiatric report says there are no signs of an organic disease. There are signs, however, that your hypomania may increase beyond the normal under stress. Drugs may help this condition as a short-term cure, but with careful attention from your family over a period of time, the disorder would not be able to render you as being certifiable. You were considered fit to plead and responsible for your actions. The man in the dock was Earl Sidney William Constable, a stumpy middle-aged bloke who wore shorts, son rain or coal. How he ended up in this pickle, facing time in jail, was a long and ever spiring downward one. He had a lot further to go after this day in court, and it started with the best possible stroke of luck. In 1962, Earl was working at Industrial Gases when, lo and behold, he won first prize in New Zealand's top lottery, the Golden Kiwi. £12,000. That sort of money could buy you a house in any upper class area of a main centre, three houses in any township. It was a fortune for the day. When his wife phoned him up to say they'd won, his name was published in the notices in the paper, a dumbfounded Earl couldn't believe it. In a state of disbelief, Constable phoned the local Christchurch newspaper to make sure it wasn't a misprint. It wasn't. They sent out a reporter to Industrial Gases to interview this happy chappy. A jubilant constable let the local readers know he'd been buying lottery tickets since 1937 and the only previous prize he'd won was £5 in an Australian lottery went on to say that him and his wife could well do with a better house since ours was a bit of a ruin. The last part of this interview is the most important for our story. Mr Constable put the four initials on the ticket and he has the arrangement with two other people who will get a thousand pounds each. Who were those two that were now also jumping for joy? One was his brother, the other was his workmate technically now ex-workmate as constable left work to go home that day and never came back. The other bloke, his workmate, was English immigrant Francis Rolt, Frank as he was known. He had an unwritten deal with Earl. If I win, I'll give you a thousand quid. If you win, you owe me a thousand. It appeared Earl was going to be good to his word. That's the thing with words. They don't tend to hold a lot of sway in the eyes of the law. They can be misinterpreted. Rout and Constable remain buddies despite Frank not getting his share of the winnings for a time. Earl did address this though, went further. When Rout said he was going back to the Channel Islands to address family issues and cure his wife's homesickness, Constable gave him not just the thousand pounds he was promised, another thousand quid as well. Jersey has always been that a bit of a tax haven and it was no different in the mid-60s. Rolt would take Constable's thousand quid and invest it tax free in a property deal. Rolt would use the money to set him and his wife up in a new house. They would live there rent free. The capital gains on the house and the house itself legally would be the property of Constable. Complicated, I know. More so when none of this transaction was in writing. Rolt sold up and travelled home to the Channel Islands with his thousand and Constable's thousand to invest. Right now, you are probably thinking that was the last Constable saw of him. Rout scuppered home, never to be seen again. You'd be wrong. Rout decided to return to New Zealand in 1967, sold the Channel Island house and purchased with that money an expensive motor for 1500 quid. returned with the car in lieu of the cash. Why he didn't fly under the radar and live somewhere else in New Zealand escapes me. Constable wasn't happy at all to see Rout motoring around the streets of Christchurch in a top-line Jaguar. 
Rout was equally unhappy and dismayed to find Constable wasn't just asking for the thousand quid invested in the Channel's island property, now an imported top-line car. He wanted the entire two grand. Things turned nasty. The respective lawyers got involved. Then it went to court. In terms of this initial case going either Constable's or Rout's way, neither one. If anyone was on the receiving end in the wash-up, it turned out to be the claimant. Constable had entrapped himself, became the recipient of the principle of unintended consequences. Rather than being an innocent appellant seeking redress, the judge pointed out that sending money overseas undeclared was illegal. Both he and Rout were both undertaking an illegal activity. The result was the judge passed no decision in terms of the distribution of the money, nor were there any fines for breaking the Reserve Bank regulations. In boxing, the reigning champion retains the title whenever the fight ends in a draw. Thus, Rout still had the £2,000. Constable was ropeable. Try as he might, he wasn't granted the right to appeal. This exacerbated his growing belief that the legal system was rigged, his lawyers were incompetent and he had been misled as to the chances of success. Even his defence team had been conspiring with the courts and that he'd been cheated by Rolt, cheated by the lawyers and the court. No one involved was exempt. It was just degrees of collusion. Top of the list was Rolt's lawyer, Ron de Goldie. He was dubbed peanut brain. De Goldie was guilty according to Constable of Slander and Perjury, began to burn off his own lawyers left, right and centre, claimed his team were deliberately holding up the appeal. He wasn't going to let any of them get away with this. In the backdrop of a letter campaign to everyone from the local president of the Law Association to the Prime Minister and the Queen, he decided he would bring things to a head with a bomb for maximum publicity. Quick interruption, if you're enjoying this podcast, you are my best salesperson. Go forth and tell your mates, back into it. He'd made a homemade bond, drove around to the two newspapers in Christchurch, their offices, on the designated B-Day, Police HQ as well, telling them in writing he was going to blow himself up and anyone in the vicinity as well goes without saying the police took these threats rather seriously began a search in the metro area for his van he and it were found in a mid-city car park the four surrounding blocks were evacuated the center of Christchurch went into lockdown inside his van sitting on the passenger seat was his bomb outwardly a biscuit tin with protruding wires his demand was simple unless the Christchurch Law Society pushed his appeal through he would detonate the device It was a given. His demands were in his tip-off letters. Pieces of conspiracy narrative being his beef with the legal system. Anyone else around when the bomb went off? A tough shit. To the relief of everyone, the Christchurch Law Society came up trumps, committed to an appeal. The bomb scare was literally and figuratively defused. In December 1969, us going back to the start of the podcast... Constable was in front of the judge, now facing a jail term. Pled guilty to the charge of criminal nuisance by placing explosives and other dangerous goods in a car park which he knew would endanger the lives of the public. The possession of blasting powder for unlawful purposes. This was not a mock bomb, potentially lethal. The judge noted he had gone to considerable thought and trouble in preparation of the action. Constable's defence was he had not wired the device to be capable of exploding. It was all for show. He wanted to raise attention to the injustice that was perpetrated against him, garner public support. That guilty plea came the hard way. On the first day the trial opened, he fired his first lawyer, who pleaded guilty, only to find that wasn't an option at this stage of proceedings. He therefore waited to the second day of the trial and fired him then. Constable and got 12 months in the clink. Not long for such a crime. He was out in six. The judge took into account he was borderline certifiable. Still, despite the stretch, 
constable was happy and that he would finally be getting his appeal which his own defence team told him repeatedly was likely to fail showed little to no contrition over the bomb business being the reason he was getting his day in court after his sentencing he said I got six months for something the law society or the justice department should have fixed up and now I've got a criminal record this rematch in the Court of Appeal occurred 12 months later. Constable wanted his two grand, not a cent less. In court case number two, it came out that Ralt had never registered the house under Constable's name. Damning evidence, indeed, Ralt was acting in an underhand manner. In the eyes of the court, a law of the land, this meant nothing. It didn't wash, it was academic. One grand or a hundred grand, it remained tainted under the counter money removed from the country illegally in a mirror image from the first trial the appeal failed constable went nuclear the entire proceeding was more evidence the legal fraternity were in collusion off went more letters to the attorney general chief justices lord justices in the uk and every member of parliament vexatious knocking on electorate doors of politicians turning up at local meetings randomly to air his beef. Neighbourhood leaflet jobs, belonging the lawyers involved in the case, also took place. Then Earl had something else crop up to get his gnashing teeth into. The houses on a street were all due to be acquired in order to create a new expressway. Acquisition was compulsory. Homeowners would get government valuation plus 20%. Every other homeowner on Bryan Street requested not you-know-who. He said he wasn't moving. Wanted 12 times the house's valuation. Adorned the front of the house with a sign. National, National Party, Party knows I have half a million on 176 Bryan Street in protest at court rigging. Unsurprisingly, this had zero effect. A year later... The house was purchased under the Public Works Act for the same price as his neighbours, by which time Mr Constable had put a price tag on the property of 10 million bucks. That, by the way, would be the exact cost in the entire budget for the expressway. This was more evidence to Constable. He was again the victim of a conspiracy upon high. Out came the paintbrush again, white paint on red brick, eye-catching, ranting against the new government on his side fence. 1st of December 1973, the Sydenham Gate case. Prime Minister N.E. Kirk robbed me of this property, knowing I was blacklisted by the Justice Department and the Law Society. Honourable N.E. Kirk put the Gestapo Act on me. For the benefit of those listening to a dedicated podcast, behind that line about the Gestapo, he had painted a crude hangman for effect. Kirk knows I have started a face tattoo in protest. In aid of his now parallel running Sydenham Gate and New Zealand's injustice system crusades, he mounted a political campaign. The rationale being... And they won't be able to dismiss or silence me when I'm a member of Parliament or on the local City Council. In the general election of 1972, he was candidate in the Rickerton electorate. 17,706 votes were cast. Constable Earl Sidney William got just 26. In the days when you went to listen to your local candidates speak in halls, his stage attire a set of pyjamas made out to be a prisoner's uniform and covered in felt penned arrows. Can't have impressed the voters any. Next lined up to contest was the local Bolly council elections under the banner of the aptly named Maverick Party. The real world though, it differs from the movies. The Dirty Ducks and Rocky Balboas get pummeled in real life more than not. There was to be no triumphant redemption. Earl Constable had a heart attack and died aged 58, 31st of March 1974, left a wife and seven kids behind, never got to stand at the local body elections, life looked oh so much more brighter for this Kiwi battler and kin, he was the winner of the country's largest lottery prize, what should have set him up for life 
set him instead down a road. He was ill prepared to venture, got well well out of his death, ruminated to the point of all consuming obsession, clear to any outsider, Earl didn't know when to say enough. In case you're wondering what happened to Ralt, he continued to live in Christchurch during all this kerfuffle, died a decade later in the mid-80s. D. Goldie's offspring are also in the local legal profession. I found this hither to untold story by accident whilst researching Zenith Applied Philosophy, found it intriguing and in need of preservation. This I have done. This one is for you, Earl. Bye for now.